time I was here, I began to do a series because our brother and our son, Chief Uziel, okay. has been after me to go into the life of David and present it once more, as I did about 12 years ago. But like everything else that should be taking place in our life, I know more now than I did then. We all know more now than we did 12 years ago. And if you're still standing in the same place marking time, you're dying. you got to keep moving. Got to keep growing. And so we, we found that David, he was thought of long before he came to the earth. He was spoken of. And if you think about how the power of the Word of God is so actuating, so great to make something happen as he has spoken it, he was actually talked up. You ever sit around and say, you know, we talked that brother up? Well, they talked him up. First, uh, Mother Leah. Then, great Jacob, our father. And they spoke of him. They spoke of him in a way of praise. He is how Judah would be praised. And he comes onto the stage of human history with a great battle. And the battle was won by the least of the battlers. The one who was so small, nobody thought he had a power to win over Galat. Galat of Gath. That's Goliath from the city of Gath. He was a big, ugly, imposing man. He was a big giant. And he actually terrified all of the Israelites who came out to the battle. But what we see is that he was dropped by one who trusted in the Almighty God. By one who had no fear of death in the sight of great adversity. He believed in God and was victorious. I want to read a couple of verses that I did last time out of the book of Isaiah. The 55th chapter, 5-5. Five, five. And this is my inspiration of how to get back into David. I'll probably read it from time to time to get me going again. But from the first verse of the 55th chapter of Isaiah, we begin to see the importance of the Word of God. Now let's read some. We're in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye for water. And he that hath no money, come, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your gain for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Let your soul delight itself in fatness, in richness. What is he speaking of here? First of all, this is the Almighty God talking. He is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he is saying to us, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. What you're doing now, what you are looking for, to make you healthy, to make you strong, to give you refreshment is the Word of God, not those things that you think your physical body needs only. Okay. These are the things that are necessary, but there is a spiritual, a spiritual necessity that supersedes this. There is a need for the Word of God, and he, I can prove it right here. He says, Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. All right. The milk represents the nourishment of the body. The wine represents the gladness of the heart to take away that soulful down depression and everything. He's telling us even better than that is the Word of God. His Word will give you not only refreshment and nourishment, but gladness of heart. He will bring you up out of those doldrums. There is no such thing as someone who praises God in their life and in holding down his word in their life of clinical depression. Uh -huh. Get away from it. Get a life. Get up out of there. He says, come here, and your gain for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, uh -huh. and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Hearken diligently unto me. How can you hearken unto God except through his word? 
So his word is the subject here. Is that right? That's what the subject is. Let's go. Verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of Dawi. Behold. I have given him for a witness to the peoples. A prince and commander to the peoples. A prince and a commander to the peoples. Right there for a moment. Right there. Incline your ear and come unto me. Again, that's why I read aloud. So I can hear his word while I'm communing with him. While I'm sitting down at my desk in my study in East New York, I hear his word because I'm reading it unto myself. His word is going into my spirit, man, and I am getting the fatness of it. I'm getting the truth of it. I'm being built up and upheld by it. And it is taking away worry and depression. And it is doing even more. He's saying, hear and your soul shall live. Well, when the word is produced to your earring, to your hearing, and to your spirit, man, hearken unto it. Put it into practice, practical application in your life. And it becomes a force in your life. Wisdom of Yah is in you continually. to 
Stand around pondering, what is I should do? I don't know, go up or down, whatever. But if you've been placing this word in your life, he says, and I will make everlasting covenant with you. That's what we're talking about. You get into God's word deeply and deeply enough, and he promises right here, I didn't make it up, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. That's why David in his lifetime once said, what is man that you even consider him? What is he that you would come from your high heaven and come to the level to even commune with me? Well, he's telling us right here, deal in my word. Come in unto me day by day and hearken. He says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you that will never change. Even the sure mercies of David is I'm going to hit you like I hit Dawid. I am going to show you that if you can come and be with me in my word and find out the life of David, I gave him for a witness to you to show you how I will be with you. We are supposed to not only look at David as a king and a forebear and a forefather, but as a brother. You check out his life and see he is not so far off that I cannot model my life upon his. Men, women, and children, model my life upon his life. Watch and see how he behaved himself wisely. Watch and see how he always trusted in the living God and came off successfully and victorious. He says, I gave, behold, I have given him for a witness to the peoples, a prince and commander to the peoples, a witness. He's the role model. We made up that phrase, role model. But there's the original one right there. One of the originals right there. He is a role model. He is an example. He is one that you can look upon his life and be thrilled by the adventures of his life and realize I can walk in those same ways. I can behave myself wisely the way he did and be upheld by heaven and that I need fear nothing down here. I want to show one more thing about the downfall of Goliath of Gath. Let's look at Jeremiah 9. I said last time the way great David brought down that big guy was that he immediately got caught upon his side by saying, how dare this uncircumcised who is not in covenant with my God defy the armies of the living God because I'm in covenant with the Father. He said, this uncircumcised one is dead already. Well, I put that his word in his mouth, but that's the way he was moving. What will you give me when I kill him, he was thinking. Now, I'm going to find a verse here. You already called it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's look at the 22nd verse of Jeremiah 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thus saith Yehoah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory of glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am Yehovah who exercise mercy, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Yehovah. In these things I delight. You see, well, you might say, well, Goliath wasn't necessarily wise. He was just a mighty man. But all these things apply. Anybody who leans on his wisdom and not upon God is coming down. He said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this. You see how Dawid came off from the battle? With great glory. He came off from battle in great glory because the mighty man gloried in his might. He flexed his muscles for 40 days out there, and he came to naught. He came to worms and dirt. His head was carried around like a trophy, and his weapons were stripped from him because he believed it in himself. Get out of that selfishness, Yisrael. There is nothing in there. Right. There is nothing in there but vanity and cruelty right. and an evil end. Right. I know whereof I speak. Stay away from that. Watch and see here. He says, but let him that glorieth glory in this, 
that he understandeth and knoweth me with a capital M, that knoweth Yah. That's the glory to remain in, to exalt yourself in that. Oh, man, I really love and respect and this and that about you. All glory to God, brother. All glory to God. He is the one. I couldn't bust a grape. I couldn't think myself out of a paper bag until I got into Word of God. And I knew I was smart in school. Couldn't do it. This is really it. <laughs> that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am Yehoah who exercised mercy. You see that? He exercises mercy, justice, and righteousness in the earth. I know we love to say, well, Most High is going to get his vengeance upon this and upon that. That only comes at the very last. Yeah. He says it again and again. I take no pleasure in the wicked that they should die. Right. I take no pleasure in that, but that they should turn from their wickedness and live. All right. Um, for these things, for in these things I delight, saith Yehoah. Mm -hmm. You take those verses and find out what delighteth. God about you and begin to live in them. And that's how David lived his life. That's how he brought such glory to his God and to his nation. Let's go to the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel. Is everybody well today? Are we doing well today? All right, then repeat after me. Father, I am grateful. Father, I am grateful. We haven't done that in a while, man. <laughs> Catch yourself from time to time and do it throughout the day from time to time, throughout the week. Just stop and say, Father, I am grateful. My goodness, you know. Car just splashed all that mud all over me. Father, I am grateful. <laughs> you know, I'm alive. Yeah, I'm alive. You know, you know what's happening. <laughs> yeah, he just drove by. And I know he ain't for that puddle. <laughs> Father, I am grateful. Or add to this from time to time when things aren't going your way because there's always a trial. If you come to serve the Lord, you're under a trial. You have come to find out he does not take slackers into his covenant. He does not take us when we have not been tried by the things that can possibly turn you against him. You have to be made sure. You have to be made proof. That's what they call waterproof, bullet proof. They have splashed water on it for 12 days so, and to find out the other side is still dry. All right? <laughs> they shot bullets into that body armor for a month. Nothing got through there. It's bullet proof. You're going to be God like when you become world proof. The world is coming at you with all kinds of misery and adversity. See, But we must not fall into it. Here's what I have learned to do. When I'm getting angry at my fellow man, I'm getting upset with my surroundings, stop and say, I love the Lord my God. With all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my might, and things start to change. Somebody getting a call? All right. <laughs> all right. 18 and 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of Dawid and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Shaul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with Dawid because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to Dawid and his apparel even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. And Dawid went out, whithersoever Saul sent him. He had good success, and Shaul sent him over the men of war, and it was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Shaul's servants. Praise God, right there. <laughs> Everything is well. And you notice every time things are going so very good, what is about to happen? <laughs> 
You're about to get a shock to the system. Something is going to come at you to make you say, you know, yeah. And, and right on the tip of your tongue is to blame God for it. Just as sure as I'm standing here, it's the Father's fault. Oops, I did you know? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You see? But we're going to see here how to behave ourselves wisely as David did. But watch this. Right after he came from that interview with Saul the king, carrying the bloody head of Goliath in his hand, he came out and his main man met him right there. And they had not known one another before. But they had the same light spirit of war. They loved to battle in the holy war of the living God. These were not bullies who went around pushing folks around. It was like this. If you invade the land, promise it unto our fathers with forces that have not been invited here, we will fight you to the death. And both of them felt like that. One was a shepherd. And the other one was called it up to his father's side as prince over all Israel, the successor to the throne of Saul, his father. And when he saw this young man go out there where he didn't even venture to go, and he knew the strength that was in his own heart, he said, now there's my boy. There. That's my kid. <laughs> That's my road dog. That's him. If there is no other cat that I can deal with, eyeball to eyeball, it's him. And he had to approach him in a way to make him know, I love what you are. I am like you and you are like me. And he looked upon him and into his eyes and here's what he did. His soul was knit, the soul of Yohanatan was knit with the soul of Dawid. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Then Jonathan, down to the third verse, made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Like spirits were attracted. I'll tell you something. <laughs> guys who do needlepoint hang out with guys who love to go shopping for yarn and stuff. You see? Right, you see, that's it. I, hey, let, let, let's go down to Delancey, man. I hear they got all new colors of yarn this year. You know, that, that's where they go, you see. But warriors walk with warriors. They talk about how weapons are more refined now, how we are able to defend ourselves even better. And they talk about the last practice they had down the way by Adon. <laughs> <laughs> Chaim's place, you know? Yeah, you know, he showed me, he showed me a technique, man, you know? You know? That's it. Those who walk together. Scholars love books and they hang out together. That's right. We're going to the library, man. We're going to go and uncover the archives and get deeper and deeper into the spiritual things that make us grow and grow. You see? But right here, warriors have been bound together here. But now this covenant business, this covenant business is very important. I got to give you a little refresher about covenant. In the ancient days when the almighty God came and approached it unto Abram to make a covenant with him, they had to, he had to slay the beasts and part them in the center and walk between them. Well, what he was doing was this. The great king of the universe was saying, I know you understand how kings and princes make covenants. So I'm going to make one with you that you can understand it. Right. And here's how men, chieftains and princes and great men went together to stop wars between their tribal factions and between nations. They came out together and besides the slaying of the beasts on either side, they exchanged things. One would take off his robe yes. of honor and majesty and place it upon his fellow. All my authority here is now your own. And he would pass his over to him. All of my authority over all of my peoples are now yours as well. They exchanged authority and empowerment. Then they exchanged weapons, right? He said, here, here is my sword of valor. From now on, your enemies are my enemies. Boom, and he exchanged it back. For here, here is my spear and my sword. With these, I conquer my enemies. From now on, 
Your enemies are my enemies. So what did Jonathan do? Jonathan saw this man here, this younger man than himself, who had just come from the sheep coat. He ain't even got a uniform. He still got on the sheep coat with the strip around his, a, a little strip of leather around the middle. That's all he got on after slaying that big monster. And he's standing there before him, and he took off his robe and laid it on him as a prince over all Israel. I make you now, other than myself. Your, uh, my authority has now become your authority. And he gave him his sword and his bow. See, this wasn't no little rinky-dink sword that was just tapped together the other day. This was finely fashioned. There were not that many weapons in Israel, but you can believe Saul and Jonathan and Abner and the toughest guys had the best of everything. And Jonathan had as his right of ascendancy to the throne a great, beautiful, crafted sword. And he gave it to him and his bow. You see? And Jonathan... He wasn't buck naked. He still had on, you know, <laughs> he, he still had on his, um, you know, the, the thing that goes underneath, you know, the undergarments, right? But he took off things that described his honor before God and before man and laid it on him. And what did he exact from David, whom he understood by this time, by the power of prophecy upon him, that he would always make the authority that God had placed upon him his. His protection of his anointing would be toward Jonathan and his seed forever. Uh -huh. That's right. And they made covenant with one another. Now, this might sound controversial, but the word for covenant is berit. Berit means cut. And I don't see here where they went and got any animals. Okay. So they cut each other. Now I feel the silence. I got my sword. <laughs> yeah, I see, in the word it says you shall not make cuttings in your flesh. He said, but that's for the dead. That's for mourning. You must not, when someone dies, go, oh, I'm so sorry, man. Brother Jones is gone. <laughs> and slash yourself the way the other nations did. All right. So I got that bit of understanding from some ancient writings that said, there were people in those days who lived like this. When they saw a man with a great wound mm -hmm. that they understood came from a covenant with another man, they were very, very careful about troubling that guy because they knew if he did slay him, there's a man in covenant with this guy, and he coming for you. All right, I'll leave that part for now. But understand, they exchanged what was theirs one with another. Yep, that and that meant from now on, I've got you. Nothing can get to you except that I avenge you. I will feed your children. That's Dawid's part. And my boy is giving him the honor of the ascendancy to the throne because he sees it in a spiritual sense. Now let's go. Verse 6. And it came to pass as they came. When Dawi returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Shaul, with timbrels, with joy, and with three stringed instruments. And the women sang one to another in their play and said, Shaul hath slain his thousands, and Dawi his ten thousands. There come trouble. Yes, sir, here come trouble. All right. <laughs> Now, I got to read, chap I mean, verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. He had good success. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. He was the man. You know, the flavor of the month. He was the baddest guy in town. And what happens is the Philistines are not just going to disappear. Their whole warlike way of thinking was conquer Israel. Yes. Get up in there and take them down. It became a fact of just plain hatred. You know, they wanted the land. Man, it's, it's flowing. 
You see, but what they are witnessing is the power of God for the people who are living there now. The Philistines would come in there and everything would dry up. That former rain and the latter rain would go away because of the evil of their ways. But they are very warlike people. They would come out in bands at night and make raids and terror raids and murder raids and uh, take off the cattle and women and things and such. So you had to have garrisons always in place. And because of the skill of David in war, he sent him as head over some troops to protect the frontiers and to go out and do battle when there were invasions and such, and he was successful. And all the people loved him like that. His name means loved and beloved and well-beloved. You see, he had good success. But when it came to pass, <laughs> as they came, when David returned from slaughter, the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of the cities of Israel. We got to slow down a minute here. All right. This is the matter of a triumph, a triumphal return from the battleground. And Saul, you saw one time before when he finished with Amalek, and Shemuel was looking for him. They said he has gone down to a certain place to build him a monument. And he went and built a monument. Saul, this day, has destroyed the Amalekites and their towns, or whatever. Well, this time, it was his idea, his idea to return and pass through all of the towns in a triumphal procession. Okay. And they would come to each town and him in the front and David and Avner and Jonathan and all of them leading the troops and coming to receive what? The accolades, okay. to receive the applause. Right. If you've never seen something like that, you look at some of the old Hollywood movies about ancient Rome yeah, no. and you see when the conquerors <laughs> return it, after they had conquered it all over the place, they would come back and the Roman citizens would give them, according to the uh, uh, approbation of the Senate, a triumphal entry into Rome. And they would throw all the things and flowers and garlands upon the crowns and all of this stuff. And, you know, yeah. Every time the uh, Yankees win the World Series, they have a triumphal parade down Broadway. Well, that's sort of like what he was looking for. And they would come to a town, and somebody, somebody during those days realized we need to have a triumphal shout and a song for when the troops come back. And somebody wrote this song here, you know. But, <laughs> you see, yeah, they should have wrote another song. Yeah. But there was a lot to David, man, you see. They say he was comely to look upon. He was handsome. Say so his eyes were beautiful. You look at it in Hebrew when you first see him in scripture. It says his eyes were beautiful. You know, Anim, Yafim, so beautiful, so strong and penetrating. When he looked into you, if you were one of them weak guys, you'd you drop you. Because know, he, he'd, he'd gaze on you like that. Whoa, yeah, how you doing? You know? <laughs> so here's what happened. The one, <laughs> the, one, the one who wrote this poem said, you know, David is the one, man. You know, I see Saul out there with the royal crown and the robe and everything, but that's the guy who brings the triumph back to Israel. And so the words were performed like that. But now the women, the women said, yeah, that, that's a good song. And everybody got their instruments and went, <laughs> boy here that, that fine man here he come and when they came marching up by their town and came into the city and into the borders of their particular villages and such say the women ran out in front and they came out with yeah you see and it was a dance it was choreographed they had a rhythm and a flow to it and they came out whoa boom boom bam Saul is slain his thousands. <laughs> David is tens of thousands. Woo, boy, you know. <laughs> you, know and you, you see how the daughters do it here, boy. <laughs> well, they had the rhythm and they was jumping and carrying on. And when David looked around at this, you know, he's trying to be humble and everything, you know. But they see, you know, he's the rock star, man. 
He is a rock star. Jack, everybody want to get a glimpse of the one who killed Goliath. And let me tell you, ladies, they tell me, whoever was out there at the front, this boy is fine. He is beautiful. He is so handsome. My God, let me get out in front. Whoa. Saul is saying his house. Woo. David, his tens of thousands. Woo. You know? And here he come, you know, and when he looked around at them, you know, I, you know, it's hard trying to tell him, well, y'all ease up, you know, and he looked around, <laughs> superstar, boy, you know, I mean, it's an event. They'd run from that town to the next town, that boy coming, you ain't never seen nothing like him, and he got on Jonathan's stuff, and he is so beautiful. And he would look at the women as he went by, you know. <laughs> My God. And every one of them gals would look in them eyes and swear, David looked directly at me, daughter. He looked in my eyes. I saw him. Yeah. <laughs> he just about betrothed me with that look. Yes, indeed, you see. So this is a wave going on, like, like at the football game, you know. It was a big wave, you see. Saul is slain his thousands, and David is tens of thousands. See? So everything was good before. Read verse 8. <laughs> verse 8. Mm -hmm. And Shaul was very wroth, and this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto Dawid ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands, and all he lacketh is the kingdom. And shall I die from that day and forward? From that day and forward. You know how it is when your main man looks on you every day, man. Shalom. <laughs> and the next day is. What's up? <laughs> you know. And, and the king has now changed his countenance. It's a done deal. You see? It's like day and night. I don't feel the love anymore, man. Where's you know? Love? Boy, where's the love? <laughs> you see? But he switched him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was a musician. He might have said that. <laughs> but from that day forward, there was no more love. I don't even like you anymore. You see? See, now you know what? The one who wrote the song, the one who wrote the song wasn't all that wrong, you see? Saul led the armies out and they killed some before David got there and before Goliath came out and scared everybody from the field. But by the time David slew him, his words of prophecy became truth. He said, this day I'm gonna take, I'm gonna slay you, take your head off and give all your army bodies to the fowl of the heavens, you see? So when he dropped, we rose up and fell on the rest of them. That's tens of thousands. He began to slay tens of thousands, so they wasn't lying. And all he had to do as king be above that. You know? This guy works for me. <laughs> My man went out there and gave us the victory. Right. Right on. Yeah, you know? That's right. And he still got a bow to me. Right. But now, there was this other spirit there, remember? Yeah. That Holy Spirit left from him and went upon David, and the evil spirit from God was upon him to make him think black things and terrible things, you know? And envy, the green-eyed monster. Now go. Yes. Verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. And he raved in the midst of the house, and Dawi played with his hand, as he did day by day. And Shaul had his spear in his hand. And Shaul cast the spear, for he said, I will smite Dawi even to the wall. And Dawi stepped aside out of his presence twice. And Shaul was afraid of Dawi, because Jehovah was with him and was departed from Shaul. Right there. Let's look at this a little closer. All right. And it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God 
came mightily upon Saul, and he raved. See, there's a word in Hebrew that said he was prophesying, or he was preaching, or he was in some kind of a, a fit of ecstasy in the midst of his house, in front of his family. He's going like this here, you know. You know, you know, and in between he's saying words like may have come from God mixed up in his, his way of saying I am in a, a fit of prophecy so that he could come out of it easily and slay David suddenly and say it was the word of God while I was in the spirit that moved me to slay my enemy, you know. So David, as a, every time, he came out with the lyre, and he was playing, you see? But the blessing of Yah is upon him. And no way he's going to allow him to be slain by this madman, you see? So while he's playing, he got his eye on him. Always. And when my boy came out of his bag, he just slipped it. Do, 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 do. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> got mad at Yeah. And that, that made him hot oh, now. Yeah. My we'll goodness, he couldn't have seen this coming. Right. You see? But there's the spirit of God upon him. There's a spiritual alertness going on. Wisdom will move him. You see? And he's a warrior. You see? He practices. He, he, didn't, he didn't stay out there with the sheep and sleep all day. And sleep and snore all night. He was on duty all the time. And when they were resting, he was practicing. He was in shape. That boy was in good shape. That man. And as a youth, in that terrible place of danger, he slipped it once. Let me see. And then he slipped it twice. You see? Now, Saul, he's always got this spear in his hand. He's a spear or a javelin. Some of the kings of those days always had a scepter in their hand or a weapon of choice. His was a spear. He always walked with a spear, you know. And he had a spear in his hand while he's making believe he's in an ecstasy. <laughs> he wasn't going to get this one. You see? He, had, he kept his eye on him at all times. My grandfather used to tell me, he said, hey, hey, listen, son. Trust everybody, but keep your eye on them. Right. I said, that's right, Grandpa. Watch him. See? Well, he was watching him. All right. <laughs> Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. You see, what he's doing here is get this boy out of my sight. You see, he's at court every day. My servants love him. Everybody loves him. He's getting fan mail more than I'm getting. You know? Get him out into the field somewhere. So he put him over a thousand and set him out. He's on permanent patrol, as it were. You see? Yeah, yeah, he, he get out of here. Let's read it. Okay. And Yeah, that's good right there. Fourteen. Yes. And Dawi had great success in all his ways. And Jehovah was with him. Right. And when Shaul saw that he had great success, he stood in awe of him. But all Israel and Yehuda loved Dawi, for he went out and came in before them. Mm -hmm. You see, everybody loves the one who will bring back victory. He would take out a thousand and come back with a thousand. He didn't come back, well, we lost 18 men. We lost this or that. They would come back not only successful in the battle, but they'd come back with spoils. You see, there, there wasn't such a thing as uh, there was a, a paymaster out there paying the army every month. That wasn't it. You got paid with what was going on, <laughs> you know. And if you were under a captain like him, you was fat. Yeah. I mean, boy, he had gold, a change of garments, weapons, everything. David's crew, man, look at them. They're glistening, man. And people love that. We are an idolatrous species. <laughs> we want to see something looking beautiful and good. That's right, man. And man, Dawid is nice, man. Boy, boy. And his, his men would come back and tell exploits of how he did out there. How he did, man. You see, he don't stay back and say, take that hill, man. 
No, he go up the hill. Right. <laughs> right. We're going to take that hill, and he the first one up there. All right? So let's read some. Yeah, God is with him. That's the point. The blessing of Abraham is upon him. It went from Abraham. It went from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Yitzchak to Yaakov to Yosef. That's the way it went. And then by the time of Jacob's passing from this world, it went into Yosef, Yehuda, and, um, well, Joseph's sons, right? And a lot of that business went into Asher with fruitfulness and stuff. But between all the 12, the blessing of Abraham was distributed upon all the 12. But by this time in history, it was the focal point of it was upon Dawid. It was actually on him. The same way the brothers couldn't kill Yosef, the same way those Midianites and uh, Arabians or whomever they were could not do any harm to him, the same way Potiphar's wife could not get him iced, the blessing was upon him. He had to stay in prison and the blessing was upon him. Wherever he was, it became fruitful. It's the same thing with David. Wherever he is, there is fruitfulness and success. Mm -hmm. And the people love that. We all do. Man, he's nice, man. Let's read some. Verse 17. And Shaul said to Dawi, Behold, my elder daughter Merab, her will I give to thee, give thee to wife, only be thou valiant for me, and fight Jehovah's battles. For Shaul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. <laughs> and Dawi said unto Shaul, Who am I? And what is my life? Or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Merab, Shaul's daughter, should have been given to Dawi, that she was given to Adriel the Mehola, like a Meholathite, the to Meholathite, wife. to wife. Do you see there the plot going on? He said, Behold my elder daughter, Merab, her will I give thee to wife. You see? Now this is, a, this is a mighty promise. But this is the promise that was made before he even killed Goliath. This was supposed to take place. She should have been given to him. But his modesty, his humility, did not allow him to go and say, Well, where's my prize? He would never do that. And when it was presented to him, he was still humble. He said, but what is my life that you should do this for me? You know? I mean, he's, he's bowing out in a way, but under that, he is saying, I will receive it, you know, in the name of the Lord. But I am not able, you know, to bring a dowry or anything. You understand me? You know, so this is like two men looking on each other, and they each know the games that people play. Right. You see? So David is behaving himself wisely. I, hey, listen, what am I that you would do such a thing? Mm -hmm. But still, the date of the marriage was set. The invites went out. Come to the marriage of David and my daughter, Merah. And when they came, he took his daughter and gave her to another man. And look. Dare you to say something. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted him to become insensate yes. and jump up mm -hmm. yeah. and say, no, no, no. You see, now that's too much. You see, you've been playing me and this and that, but you know, yeah. then I can kill you. Yeah. See, once you come out of your bag and seize him. We got him for treason right now. You've seen him. He's threatening to attack the king. Is it not my right to get, you know, he could, he had the whole thing planted out. Man. It was a done deal. I'm going to get him today, Jack. You see? I got you for sedition, right? But when it happened, David went on about his business. Mm -hmm. You see? Now, what are we to learn from that? You see? You got to learn from that. You see, you don't rise up with them who are mightier than you. <laughs> Do not play that game. They looking for you to step right into that valley of death. Come right up in here, boy. Come right up in here. You see? And also, 
He saw the triumphal parades and how the people responded. The wisdom that is in him says, this guy is jealous of me. You know, he's sending me out to the most dangerous parts of the frontier to fight the battles of the Lord, as he says, you know. The wars of the Lord are those that are ordered by heaven. The ones that are evil are the ones that are ordered by man for his own success, for his own gain, or for his own evil intention. And still he was coming off right with those kinds of assignments, you see. And so now, this great affront, I mean, he smashed him in the face, you know, what they call, I punked you. Now, everybody who was in the assembly at that day when he does this, they look to David. And he waiting, he ain't even looking on him. He waiting for him, just go ahead and jump, sucker. Come on, get froggy and leap. <laughs> Ooh, I'm waiting for him to leap. You know, and David just bowed out. Yes, yes, right. Hey, good choice. Oh. <laughs> Adriel, good man. Yes, indeed. Oh, boy. See? Yeah, you see? You see? You see? And try it. If you do not deal in deceit, the Holy Spirit of discipline will remain with you. See? The Holy Spirit of discipline fleeth from deceit. See? If he had not that Holy Spirit of discipline and wisdom, he'd have reacted. No, man, now that's wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, hey, I got enough troops to talk yeah. today. Kings you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and notice he is never talking about, hey, the anointing oil is on me. No. He no. never mentions this. Never. Prince Yadiel. Let's read it. No, he never even told him. <laughs> yes. Now, but it came to pass, we'll sneak on, now Mikhail Saul's daughter loved Dawi, and they told Shaul, but the thing pleased him. And Shaul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Shaul said to Dawi, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law through one of the twain. And Shaul commanded his servant, Speak with Dawi secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Shaul's servant spoke these words in the ears of Dawi. And Dawi said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man, and lightly esteemed? That's right. And the servants of Shaul told him, saying, On this manner spoke Dawi. And Shaul said, Thus shall he say to Dawi, The king desired not any dowry, but a hundred foreskin of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. For Shaul taught to make <laughs> Dawi fall by the hand of the Philistines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when his servants told Dawi these words, it pleased Dawi well to be the king's son-in-law. Right there. You see that? All right. You see? <laughs> now, that's it? He, he, made, he, made, he made believe he didn't know what the game is. You see? So they come with to him with more game. Hey, you see, listen, man. Saul really desires to make you his son-in-law. You see? And uh, so he goes right back in. Well, I can play the game, too. You think it's a small thing to be the king's son-in-law? Hmm? That's not a small thing. I don't have no dowry. I can't go to the... I don't have no 12 cows and this and that to come to, to Saul to present myself eligible to be his son-in-law. So they go back and say, well, you know what he's saying, man? He's ashamed because he's a poor young man. He said, good. All right, listen, tell him this one. He got to go for this. I don't need no gold and no money or nothing. Get me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines so that I may be avenged upon my enemies. You know what? what it meant to a Philistine to be circumcised? <laughs> Evil! That is the most disgusting right they had ever heard of. Ain't nobody touching this. See? So now, if he go out there and start taking foreskins, then all the Philistines going to want his head. See? Not just the hundred that he killing. Thousands are coming. He's taking the foreskins of our brothers, man. We got to kill this sucker, man. Whoa. So Saul is really pressing in here. I, I, he got to be dead on this one, you know. 
See, but he, he talking to somebody who don't like Philistines anyway. That's right. He's a, Okay, I, I like it. I like it. That's what I do. I like it. You know, so he got he got his men, his solid warriors. You know, they've tried one another. You know, when you go out to battle with men that you are used to battling with, you ain't even got to talk commands and stuff. It's happening. It's working. We're in that flow, man. In the heat of battle, each one knows exactly where he stands and who's there. I know. I see something by my peripheral vision coming from that way, but Abishai is there already. That's like a dead and don't know it. You see? So everybody is moving like one. He's, he tells his guys, we're going out and get a hundred foreskin. Let's rock. Let's rock. Because you know what? Not only are they going to take their foreskin, they're going to take their money, their weapons, <laughs> and the garments. going to take every kind of thing. All right? So now, he agrees that's all I got to do to get Mikhail. See, now Mikhail loved him. Mikhail loved him and he knew it. See, because she fell in love with him, man, way back when. And she's watching him. And every time he's at court, she got it. And, yeah, and he looked on her. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> you see, all of them <laughs> was on him. <laughs> you know, but there was something about her. And the people who witnessed it said, listen, Saul, Mikhail is hooked on this brother. Right, I got him. That's my baby daughter. Everybody among the men and women who have daughters, you know, the father got a special league with that daughter. You know, there's something, there's something about a man and his daughter, you know. And he's thinking of her like this. Even if the Philistines miss, I've got her. I can work her because that's my baby girl. My baby girl is always on my side. But love is bigger than that stuff, baby. <laughs> no, 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 no. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, because they're going to have to be married. <laughs> and after that married business, <laughs> bye, Abba. <laughs> this is my man. <laughs> you was the only man in my life, but this man, this man, I'm talking about this man, this is the man, <laughs> every woman in the whole country is going to be saying, she got him, that's right, all right, let's read it, middle of verse 26, yeah. <laughs> and the days were not expired, and and Dawi arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And Dawi brought their foreskins and gave them in full number to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Shaul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. And Shaul saw and knew that Jehovah was with Dawi, and Michal, Shaul's daughter, loved him. And she loved him. And Shaul was yet the more afraid of Dawi, and Shaul was Dawi's enemy continually. All right, right here. Okay, now, 26, And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. In other words, he gave him a time limit. Get me a hundred foreskins by this time, you know, next week or something, whatever it was. He said, that ain't no problem. Yeah, yeah. So he came back, you know, <laughs> Before the time was up, he finished the job. You see? Now, he came back with 200 foreskins. Now, the, the matter with that is what we just agreed upon. They hated circumcision. That was like, you have deformed our fallen soldiers, man. You, you deformed them in the worst way. You see? My goodness. We got, we, and we going to. Do you dirt when we get you? You see? <laughs> well, they, they didn't go nowhere this whole time. <laughs> this whole time on the throne, they were still there waiting for him. You see? But, <laughs> yeah, he, that was the worst disrespect. And who but Saul would think of such a thing? You know, uncover the guy's nakedness and chop off his foreskin and bring it to me. And people like Chief Kohat said one day, people say David wouldn't do that. He let the men do that. 
<laughs> However it worked out, he if he touched them, okay. he was still defiled. You know. But that there was not his his intention, you know, to presumptuously sin against God. What it was was he was keeping his word. Now he came away with two hundred of those things and brought them back. Can you imagine that interview? Bring them in, guys. You ask for a hundred, almighty king. Here's one, two, three, four, five. Bring the rest of them in. Six. You see? Yeah. 185. 186. And Saul got to sit there and receive it. <laughs> this guy, this guy, <laughs> take the girl, man. <laughs> I believe you. I put the rest of them in the bags and get them out of here. They're starting to stink. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. But that it is what it is. <laughs> That's what you asked for. I do not. I learned from my Abba. Not to bring back shorts. I bring the whole count. All right. <laughs> yeah, in the 30th verse. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass, as often as they went forth, that thou we prospered more than all the servants of Shaul, so that his name was much said by. I want to read a couple of verses from Psalm 18. And it refers to these days here in the life of David. Psalm, the 18th chapter. Psalms, the 18th chapter, I should say. And... Psalm 18. Hang up that telephone. Psalm 18. <laughs> All right. And go to the 30... Second verse. Once again, we're in the book of Psalms, chapter 18, starting from the 32nd verse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For who is God save Yehoah? And who is a rock except our God? The God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way straight. Who maketh my feet like hinds and setteth me upon high places. Who trains my hands for war so that mine arms do bend the bow of brass. Thou hast also given me thy shield of salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up. And thy condescension, Slika, hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me and my feet have not slipped. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back till they were consumed. I have smitten them through so that they are not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with the strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also made mine enemies turn their backs unto me. And I did cut off them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save. Even unto Yehovah, but he answered them not. You see that? He said, it was God Almighty that taught his hands to war. It was God Almighty that trained him in the battle. He didn't go to boot camp and learn nothing. He was spurred on by that Holy Spirit of wisdom that was within him, breathing God's truth into him everywhere. When he went out to war, he chased them down. Those days that were, it says where he was very successful above all of the other leaders of the troops mm -hmm. because he became superhuman. Let me tell you something. Superman, the comic strip, mm -hmm. was invented by two Jewish boys way back in the 19, early 30s somewhere when they first drew Superman as a comic strip for the newspapers. And they modeled some of these things on him because there's another place. We'll see it when we read 2 Samuel 22, which is a recapitulation of this psalm, but more enhance it. 
He said, I leaped over a wall to catch them guys, you see? And that's how they describe Superman. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look up in the sky. Well, you know. But <laughs> but it, it was this, this empowerment of heaven that nothing could touch him. You see? It was like uh, Moses couldn't die, so God had to make him die. Command him. Go in the mountain and die. That's what took his life out. So with David, nothing could harm him. And he realized that. And from Saul's vantage point, he was afraid of him. Look at this man. Yeah. My God, every time he comes back, he has more and more of a following. <laughs> yeah, no. Boy, I keep setting him up. We're going to read a little more because we're not going to go as long as last time. We're going to do this whole series in increments increasingly adding to what went before until we have his whole life before us. Let's begin to look at him as an example, the way the prophet Isaiah said, you know, he is a witness given to you. He is a leader. I'll give you a, a time after next. We're going to see when, when uh, he's run into the wilderness. This won't even happen next time, but I'll just give you a little right now and then I'm going to close out here. But what's going on? That's about right. What time we stop? Okay. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a little of this and then I'm going to have a closing statement right here. 19. We're in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 19 starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Shaul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should slay Dawid. But Jonathan, Shaul's son, delighted much in Dawid. And Jonathan told Dawid, saying, Shaul, my father, seeketh to slay thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself in the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will speak with my father of thee, and if I see aught, I will tell thee. Do you see how now desperation is set in? He tried one way, then he tried another way. See, the action of giving Merob to someone else didn't provoke him. Telling him to go get a hundred foreskins didn't get him killed. He came back with 200, smiling like, he, I'm glad that I was able to bring the dowry you asked for. <laughs> 198. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what happens here is he fed up. He get up one morning and said, damn it. You, 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 and you. Kill him. I want him dead here. You see, I'm, I'm not I'm not playing no more. Jonathan, you hear me? Yes. Kill your boy. That's it. You are the successor to my throne. Do you understand? As long as he lives, you don't get to be king. That's right. Kill him. That's it. That's it. And here's how he looked at it. No, my covenant is with David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. will of God. That's the will of God that he ascends and I descend. Yeah. There is nothing I am going to do. But he can't speak this to his Abba. You understand with all of the foolishness of Saul, he loved and honored his father. In the end, he went down to death with him. That's right. We're not going to let his father go down alone. One of the greatest warriors who ever lived. He went up there to die with Abba. That, that's it. So even now, he is not going to defy him, but he's going to present a case for his friend. Okay, that's see, with respect, Abba. What do we get from that? We get a lesson, man. Your parents are supreme. Amen. Supreme intelligence in this earth. There is nothing bigger than that, man. We just heard Chief Benyamin speak about it, man. That honor that is owed to them. He even researched the scriptures to show you what, what you mean to your parents when you are foolish. You are like death to their flesh, man. What is it? Month after next, my Ema turns 90. She tell me, come here, boy. I'm halfway there. No, I'm 68 now, you know. 
I mean, I'll be 68 soon. Understand, Ima? You don't do that no more. No, no, no. I tried that once when I was 22. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what happened. I'm sorry you asked. <laughs> We were visiting family, and my mother said something to me. I was drinking up all the scotch. <laughs> she said, calm down. Don't you think you had enough? I said, hold it, hold it. You see, I'm 22 years old now. You don't tell me when I've had enough. And I felt so cool. <laughs> Man, I've got that thing off. And, and Ema looked down. And she didn't say anything. Well, we get away from that place, and I don't have enough yet. I go to a bar on Sutton Boulevard. Everybody else gone home like they got sense. I go in the bar, and I order some more. And it seemed like the men's room, people keep going in and out of there. You can't even get in there to use it. I got to use the men's room. So I go outside, go around the side of the bar to relieve some water. Okay. By the time I zip up and turn around, a guy opens up my head right here. It was either a key or a knife. Right cross. Bang! Took me down and he just stripped all the money, wallet, and everything. And he gone. And my mother lives straight, straight up, straight up Linden. I'm on Linden and Sutphin. She's at 144th Street. I got to walk back to her house. Bleeding. Bleeding like this here. Blood falling down, and I'm staggering, and I get to the door, and I ring the bell, and her second husband, I call him Abba, he opened the door, and she was coming down the stairs behind him. He said, bye, don't look! And he covered me and pushed me back outside and put me in the car and drove me to Jamaica Hospital. And he was telling me, he said, man, is your eye gone? Oh, like I was looking inside your head, man. And he took me in the emergency room, and they put everybody out, you know, he's next, he's next, you know, and sat me down. And the doctor smelled all that liquor, you know. And he took that flap that was laying down here and put it back up there and pressed it like that. They said, does that hurt? I said, yes. He said, good. <laughs> and he got the needle and sold me. He said, I hope this hurts you. <laughs> You stink. <laughs> and you sold it. And trying to. T yeah. Here's a prescription for some penicillin. And get out of my sight. Yeah. You see? Now, this is a doctor. Yes. By hindsight, I know that's God yelling at me. You see? And my Abba put me back in the car and took me back to Brooklyn. You know, he said, you want to come home? And no, I don't want to see him all tonight. No, no, no. So that's what happens. If she say, come here, boy, I'm halfway there. You see? That was my lesson. That's right. 22 years of age. No more. <laughs> Please. And I'm telling them youngsters. And, and some of them who are approaching your middle age, your parent is alive, bow down to them. Let their life be a comfort to them. You see? And the young ones, if you get so stupid as to let your child get away with dishonoring you, you are breaking the law of honor thy father and thy mother. That's you breaking it. You let them get away with it. You have broken that law. Amen. You gotten that? <laughs> so, Jonathan, he kept his place subservient to Shaul. He had to look at a man who was a fool before God and give him honor. That's right. That's it. All the days of his life. And when we come back next time, you'll see how David makes this stratagem to find out if Saul is really out to kill him. Okay. He already knows it, but he needs Jonathan to see it for himself. Yeah. Yeah. See it with your own eyes, experience it, and then let me flee, because I have to leave. I have to go far away. 
Because bless I and see before I stop, remember those two spears that came at him and he slipped them. Yeah. You know what a warrior would most likely do? <laughs> I take it up and nail you right where you are. And he had the skill to do it. He had to back off of that feeling. Move, move, and go. You see, it's better to flee from that, man. Amen. Amen. So I don't have any more closing statements. Chief Azaria made me tell my adventure of talking down to my Ema. Never again. God forgive me. Well, I thank God for this time to stand in the midst of the congregations of the Lord. May the Most High God bless us all. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Shabbat Shalom.